So your books need to get noticed for all the right reasons. As a smaller independent publisher, you've got to be better than the big guys, and design is a big part of that overall picture. So picture this scenario. You're an executive hoping to hire this particular young woman who has a stellar resume. You know she's perfect for the job. She walks into the interview wearing a crazy dress, mismatched socks with sandals, ridiculous glasses, a wig. As a manager, would you take her seriously? Would you spend your time listening to her? Would your, her look distract you from her words? Would you question that stellar resume? I think most people would have trouble with that. Your book's design is like a person's professional clothing. It speaks volumes about what's inside your writing, whether you want it to or not. Readers tend to prejudge your credibility as an author by what they see on the cover and the interior. If you want people not only to read your book, but to take you seriously as an author, show them respect first by dressing your book properly for its job, again, both inside and out. So did you realize that each piece of the book actually has a different job? When seen first, the spine is the attention getter or like a mini billboard. If it does its job, you'll pick up the book to view the front cover. All right, so we were talking about the front cover serving as a primary billboard. And you know that billboards need only if or only have a few seconds to get your attention, and that's true with a cover. Um, it, this cover should be intriguing, enticing somehow, and if it does its job properly, your next step is to flip the book over and read the back. So the back cover serves as an advertisement. It provides, should provide easy to read, bite-sized information to hook that potential buyer on your book. If the back does its job properly, you'll flip open the book to glance through it further. The interior is actually what gets the buyer to the cash register. If it's organized well, if it looks easy to read, if the contents are easy to follow, you'll likely win that sale. If not, your competition does. This process happens not only in person, but also online, thanks to all the thumbnail covers and the look inside features online. So because design is so important, you want to make sure that you work with an experienced designer. This says, if you think hiring a professional is expensive, wait till you hire an amateur. I love this saying. We've worked with far too many people who found this out the hard way and spent many thousands of dollars before they ever hired us to finally produce their book. It is so heartbreaking to us that people would have had wasted money, wasted time, and shared so much heartache over this when this should be a really exciting, enjoyable experience. Many people don't realize that graphic designers have specialties, just like doctors or engineers. You probably wouldn't go to a podiatrist to treat an ear infection, and you shouldn't go to an advertising or maybe web designer if you're in need of book design. Most designers can create almost anything, but we don't necessarily do everything well. I've created many decent logos for small businesses over my career, but I certainly know better than to try designing one for a Fortune 500 company. It's not my forte. Non-book designers don't know the nuances of the parts and details of a book and the publishing industry, and that can potentially cost you time and money along the way. We've rescued many books that were originally created by artists that didn't specialize in book design. And frankly, when you don't know what you don't know, you don't know you're doing a poor job. A book designer with experience and knowledge of the publishing process will save you time, hassle, and money throughout the whole project. Keep in mind also that some design firms specialize in only covers, some in only interiors, and others are quite adept at both. An important tip for you, if you choose to hire two separate specialists, be sure up front that they're willing to work with each other to ensure that the design and branding that started on the cover has continuity throughout the whole book. I know there are some designers who just don't like to share their files or things, and it's just you need these designers to work well together in order to get one cohesive product. 
Good designers know how to use each element of a book's cover to properly guide the reader into the book and each element of the interior to guide the reader through the book. They understand how to make your book, book both fit into its genre, yet stand out from the competition. They have an expert understanding of the use of proper typography. They know the software well. They have experience working with printers. And hiring an expert frees you up to continue doing your job, whether you're still writing or you're working on marketing plans. So what is cover design and why does it matter? What's a good cover? You probably already know that that front cover has to grab someone's attention within less than seven seconds. That is asking a lot of something that's about six by nine and it has no sound or motion, especially these days. Because of this, its creator has to be resourceful with each element in the cover's design. There are five primary ways to grab attention with design. These are the use of type, image, which can be a piece of art or photography, color, size, which is the size of type, the size of elements, size of images, and space. We're going to take a brief look at just how two of these affect the cover's ability to send the right message. This first one is type. Now there are tens of thousands of typefaces or fonts out there, and each has a purpose. A good designer will not only know the appropriate fonts for your book, but how to combine them effectively. This book is a book of prayers and meditations written in a style of a wrap. Its primary target market is people living in the inner city who struggle with drugs and crime. It's a really unique book. So this title is called Action of the Times. And I have this backwards. Well, rats. <laughs> We'll show you the actual cover here. This is actually called Hardline Grunge. It's a simple, it's really easy to read, it's modern, has a little bit of grunge inside, but not so much that you can't read it. It's condensed, so it allows for the type to be big. Its straight edges contrast nicely with the photo, and it allows for those stressful scribbles to make a real impact. Now let's see what doesn't work. This is the action of the times. It, it's a struggle, <laughs> but it's yeah. I'm sorry. It's way Tim. too playful. I'm takes sorry. away from the seriousness of this. <clears throat> Good, huh? You see the difference? Yeah. Yeah. So okay, let's take something a little more classic. This is Catalan. It's much more serious. And it allows the photo's message to come through, but it lacks an impact, and it definitely doesn't seem to fit the book's audience. And now we show the final cover again. Uh, it's such, it's amazing what a difference the right typeface can make. So before I show you the next slide, I want to talk about color. It's a super powerful tool. It evokes an instant emotion, and it can send strong messages to your viewer. And here's a tip for you. Color has different meanings in different industries, and especially in other countries. For example, red is a poor choice of color for a finance book. I think we all get that. In Western cultures, blue represents the birth of a boy, whereas in China, blue is a feminine color. In Ireland, green is associated with good luck. But in many South American cultures, green symbolizes death. So we really need to be aware of where your book is going to be marketed and sold. Make sure your designer takes this usage into consideration. So now I'm going to show you one cover with four different background colors. And without reading much of it at first, I want you to think about what comes to mind within the first second or two of seeing it. Ready? Here we go. A lot of people think money, finance, green energy. Purple, we think self-help, spirituality, and inner energy, enlightenment. Let's try taupe. It's kind of boring. A business book, maybe a textbook. Let's see the actual color in this vibrant orange. It's invigorating. It's a color of ideas, of creativity, and of ambition. What a difference. So because good, good design is generally easier to show than explain, 
I believe the examples following will help you understand the importance of having a professional design created by a book specialist. Doing this can save you a lot of money and heartache and also delay. You, most people have, have set schedules and nobody wants a delay in their schedule. So now what not to wear if you're a book. This is a before example of a young adult fantasy and the cover the cover idea, this honestly didn't get published, but it was the author's idea. I really loved this. And it's too literal. We already know there's a talisman involved because of the title. We don't need to see it. And frankly, that's kind of a boring talisman. And his book is far from boring. This book is a story of two elf, elf tribes. And they live in the jungle, and they don't get along. There's a light elf tribe and a dark elf tribe. Throughout the book, they learn how to get along. So this cover shows um, shows much more intrigue. It hints to those two jungle-dwelling tribes and how they may interact. The Irresistible Consultant's Guide to Winning Clients. This is a book for business consultants. This original one was done by a, a current publishing house. It looks dated. The steps are very literal. We, the six steps to unlimited clients and financial freedom is a subtitle. We already know that there's steps. Um, it, it's just lacking interest, and the graduated tone at the bottom of teal is very dated. So we wanted to keep the same color scheme because it is a client's business color scheme. But we wanted to clean it up bring it into today's time and we want to photograph and this photograph by using it inside a circle makes it very intimate a handshake is an intimate contact and while it can be overdone in this in this usage it's done very nicely this flat color is a much better use of this color scheme and everything just is clean and simple so this is Living in Pioneer Times. It's a book of facts about pioneer living and how we can incorporate those into our lives today. The original was done by a medium-sized publisher. It's been around a while. It's super hard to read. The photo is of poor quality. It takes so much work for the reader to decipher this. I know I personally just choose not to figure it out and turn away. That red and the bluish gray stripes just hurt my eyes. And it does not look like this has any information to help today. This new book gives the immediate feeling of that time. It's warm. It has appropriate imagery, yet it's clean and easy to read. And we asked the, the uh, author to update the subtitle so that now there's a hint that this is usable information and not just a historical book. So what about novels? This novel was done by a vanity press. It looks like old classic literature. It actually has the publishing company at the bottom for some reason. This story is actually filled with action and intrigue. It takes place both in Europe and in the United States. You'd never get that from this cover. But the after cover shows a lot of information, a lot of action, yet it's not too busy. So you know there's there's something that takes place in Texas. You see the flag. That text on the top right is in German, which hints that something might take place in Germany. You have the crosshairs in, in the O that are intriguing, showing some kind of potential murder mystery, but yet it's not in your face. And this is a chapter book, and it's the first in a series called Iggy the Iguana. You can't read the title. You can't read the text. The illustration is really rough and muddy. Um, it's not very attractive for adults or kids. This is a night and day difference. This new one clearly shows that it's part of a series. It's interesting. It's fun for the readers. We've cleaned up a new illustration. It lends interest to the characters. All the text is readable. And we're adding a line stating that the author has another series of books as well. 
So if you've done that, if you've written more than one book, you want to be sure to reference that on your cover. You know, Tammy, I, uh, I, I'm just going to jump in here and, and state one of the things that I've seen over and over again in the years is, uh, I know you're going to get to font uh, at some <laughs> point, but this, the Iggy the Iguana, that's a font that you can find in any desktop publishing or Microsoft program. And your Iggy the Iguana, one of the things that, that I, I say to people is that if you can pull the font out of your Word document on your laptop, it's prob it probably doesn't belong on the cover of your book. <laughs> and, uh, great advice, Amy. It's honest to God, guys. I, you know, these, you know, people that go, oh, nobody knows this font. We all know all of them. And for those of you who are asking, we got some great questions coming up. I promise I am good. I'm letting Tammy give her presentation, but we are going to get to your questions. I promise. And with that, Tammy, I'm going to shut up and let you get on. But I just, when I saw the Iggy the Iguana font, I'm like, I bet you I could name that if you gave me a second. <laughs> Yeah, there's a lot of there's a lot of them, and two you should never use are Comic Sans and Papyrus. And I know somebody just groaned over the Papyrus because they love it so much. Don't use it on a book; it's really overused and very dated. For there those other... of you who were on my Free Advice Friday two hours ago and heard me making fun of Comic Sans and Papyrus, <laughs> I did not know that she was going to say that. We have not heard on this. That was a total coincidence, and now I'm going to shut up. Oh, that's wonderful. I love it. <laughs> so we were talking about a series that Iggy began a series. So if you intend for your book to be the first of a series, let your designer know right away. They'll take this into consideration. We'll offer a design plan for future books that includes a series logo and a layout that somewhat remains the same, yet is flexible within parameters to hold different images, titles of varying lengths. It's very helpful to the designer to know all of the book's titles when we're designing the first book, though it's not a requirement. That first book will be used to build your audience, gain a following, let people fall in love with the characters, or if it's nonfiction, to really know that they can trust that information within. Each book that follows will look similar to that beloved first one and be instantly recognizable as a must-buy item. You can think of the Wimpy Kid books or the Four Dummies books, Harry Potter. There are so many. So this is Turtle Town. This is a chapter book series that was spawned from that Iggy series. Now, Melissa, the author, was so smart. She based a character from the Iggy book in the, in, in the Turtle Town, so Snap the Turtle from Turtle Town was in the Iggy books. And this Turtle Town series is for an older audience. So when people outgrow, when the kids outgrow Iggy, they can fall right into Turtle Town. I just think it's a brilliant move. Um, this series, the basic layout doesn't change. Each one has a different title. The color changes, and there are other subtle changes. Even the shape around the illustration is different but it doesn't take away from the fact that this is very obviously a series. So this is a very simple and elegant design that easily holds a new photo, sports a different color for each book, and not much else changes. And this tip series may look fairly simple, but updating the design can get very tricky. Four new photos have to be selected with the background image being interesting, yet simple enough to allow readability for the title. A new color scheme has to be selected that supports readability, all the photos, and the book's theme as well. But, you know, these are very different in imagery and colors, but it's still very obvious that it's part of a series. So we've talked about the front cover, but that's only part of the picture. What about the back and the spine? This cover as a whole needs to present a cohesive, informative package to get the reader into the book. With each piece of that cover having its own job, as we discussed earlier, they all need to work together to present one branded cover. So let's go through a few tips for back covers. Be sure not to waste that back cover. This book on the left was obviously the, the uh, Living in Pioneer Times from, that we just looked at, and it wastes so much space, not to mention it's off-center. The new one, uses space wisely without jamming it full of too much copy. Of course, we don't want to overload it like the book on the left. 
you see the book on the right is much more open. It uses space more uh, wisely, and it sections pieces of the back cover off so that you can easily digest each section. Now jackets uh, for a hardcover are definitely going to hold different kinds of information in different places than a soft cover. Usually the back cover of a soft cover is going to have a blurb about the book. Well in a jacket that moves to the inside flap on the right. And then the inside back flap, which is on the left, holds the, about the author information. This gives you a lot of space on the back for testimonials, maybe for teaser copy. And then a how-to book, which is on the left, has to offer different types of information than the novel on the right. And your designer needs to know this. They can coach you through what kind of information to use. On the left, bullet points are almost almost a must-have for a nonfiction book. You have headlines on both. You've got barcodes on both. You want information about how to contact the publisher on both, whether you have a logo and a URL or just the URL. Um, about the author is often present on a back cover, but not required. Sometimes you'll see the photo, sometimes not. On the right, we have a blurb about the book to get you into the storyline right away. On the left, we have a short blurb to tell you what you're going to learn, along with the bullet point and then some testimonials. So let's look at a few full covers. Let's see how the front, the spine, the back present a cohesive picture while doing their respective jobs properly. This book is Fortune Cookie Devotions. It is a devotional inspired by the author's Fortune Cookie Collection. Very interesting book. That fortune paper strip, the three that you see on the cover, that we've taken one and put it on the back cover for continuity. That cover image wraps onto the spine, which is a really nice way to not only offer continuity, but to ensure that when your book is printed, the spine, the delineation between colors of the spine is not off. Now, we can get into this another time, but if you're printing on demand, maybe through CreateSpace or IngramSpark, that technology is less sophisticated than if you're going to print offset perhaps a 1,000 books. So the spine edges are often off when you're printing on demand and sometimes digitally. Um, so if we know that ahead of time, we're going to be very careful with how we design that spine so that there's not a hard edge. This book, having said that, is being printed offset by a very high-end printer. We have the confidence that the spine is going to be right on, so we knew that we could do this. And the imagery on the front and back cover is far too busy to be an effective background for a spine. This is a corporate gift book. It teaches time management in verse. Um, and it's a hard, small hardcover that's going to have a little ribbon in it. So it's very obvious how the front and back are very cohesive. Children's books often have an image that wraps all the way across the book cover. The story summary on the back you'll see is found in the sky, just like the title on the front. The testimonials hanging out in the little tree. And not all the kids' books have text on the back cover. And I know some people are okay with that. I honestly think it's a waste of paid advertising space. I, I hate to see a back cover that has no information whatsoever. I really think you need to use that as a teaser. So, and this is Dark Talisman, the full jacket. The information is placed diff on different places on the book jacket, like we talked about. The descriptive copy, front flap, the author bio on the back, there's contact information on the back. Now we wrapped vines around the barcode on the bottom for a little more intrigue. Barcodes, if you're printing offset, barcodes don't have to be boring. If you're printing with CreateSpace, with IngramSpark, they require a white box with specific dimensions for your barcode. Um, we had a book that we printed offset, which simply is a more sophisticated way of printing and, and a good way to print if you're printing a thousand books or more. 
we put in this, this humorous book on fatherhood. The barcode was li literally the shape of a diaper. Just perfect. So branding and design shouldn't stop with a cover. Often it does. Unlike Would it be many products. It's appropriate to ask if the barcode that was in the shape of a diaper was it yellow or was it white? <laughs> well, the barcode is still black, but it was All a right. cream color behind it. All right. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny, Amy. Um, so yeah, a lot of people just ignore their book's interior, and they think the branding stops on the front, like a box of Tide or something. This is not your typical product. The book's interior is highly visible. It's an important part of your book's packaging. So what is interior design? Why does it matter? Let's dive in. It's simply the process of formatting every page in a book with the primary purpose of readability. What is not so simple is putting all of its elements together into a seamless package. Let's examine a few of those interior details and why they matter. This is a page from a nonfiction book about buying a second home in Mexico. The text is a boxed in sidebar, and it's a really typical example of what we see from novice typesetters and non-book designers. There are a lot of things wrong. I think you'd agree that it doesn't look like something fun to read. And um, I see papyrus up on top. <laughs> so problem number one. Dead with the exact <laughs> same tune is, I see dead people. <laughs> I see yes. papyrus. Papyrus <laughs> should be dead. <laughs> Don't get me wrong. It was awesome when it first came out like 20 years ago. But um, at any rate, number one shows tiny margins. There are absolutely no margins inside the box. That text is touching the line of the box. The margins between the box and the edge of the page are also too small for a book. Number two, they're hard to see, so I've got it illustrated here, but these are straight quotation marks. You'll see them in gray. We see them everywhere. That top one is an inch mark. The bottom one is a foot mark. They are not quotation marks. A serif font will often have curly quotes. They're also called smart quotes in the center and in sans serif. They're called the same thing, but you can see that they're weighted differently and they're kind of curled. Now, every font has different styles of quotation marks and apostrophes, but they all have the option of using both the right and the wrong marks. And we can get into that another time. There are keyboard commands to get them. There are settings in your programs to get them. And a very last resort is for your designer to search and replace yours in the end. Now, number three, this is ragged right. And a lot of people like to use it. I'm not positive as to why. But it has been proven that it's harder to read in books than than a justified text box where it's justified on both sides. So we highly encourage, unless you have poetry or something, a kid's book with very, very little text, we highly encourage you to have justified text. Number four, we have inconsistent headings. This one next to the number is in italics and bold. The one above it is simply in bold. So which one is it? You just need to pick one and be consistent. Number five is in the wrong place. So number five overall, if you see three lines down from number four, you will see that there are two spaces in between those sentences. And you see it throughout this page. That is no longer appropriate. It is not good typography. If you're old like me, you learn to type two spaces in between sentences when we were doing using typewriters. The advent of commercial typography on computers, that's no longer necessary and it's actually a distraction. Again, you know what else this tells me, Tammy? Yes. There's a chance this manuscript was not properly copy edited by a professional copy editor because a professional copy editor would have caught that. And that is somewhat true. Some editors are still old school and don't make those changes, assuming that the designer will make them for you. 
so, but yes, that is a red flag that I, if I saw this, my, I would go back to the author and find out, did you truly have this professionally edited? Um, that's a very good point. But like I said, some editors just leave that to the designer. So number six, the heading for this bullet list is floating really high above the actual list. So you don't know if it's really a heading or if it's just a line all by itself. Don't make your readers work so hard. Number seven, this happens all the time. The bulleted text is floating away from the actual bullets. So instead of three rows of bulleted text, you see two columns, a vertical column of bullets and a vertical column of text. You see in my sample on the right the difference. That bullet should lead you immediately to the type. Number eight points out the use of two hyphens together rather than the appropriate N or M dash. We can get into all the crazy appropriate typography, but Two, di two hyphens in a row is never appropriate. That is not a true typographical mark. So you need to use either a hyphen, an in dash, or an m dash. If you're not sure what to use, ask your editor, and he or she will be able to let you know. And the last one, number nine, is the folio or page number, which is also in papyrus. And it's so low, so close to the corner and close to the bottom that it's in danger of getting cut off when the book is printed and trimmed. So now that you can see the designed page, I'd rather read the second clean one, and I hope you would say the same. It's such a huge difference when things are done properly. Interior design so often goes quietly unnoticed when it's done well, but it's really obvious when it's not. A poorly designed interior can inhibit your sales. It can even prevent your book from being reviewed or carried in stores. Good design can take up more space. You can see that there's less text on the right than on the left. But adding a few more pages to your book doesn't cost as much as losing sales or credibility as an author, an expert, or publisher. Once again, you need to dress your book well to show respect to your reader. We believe that a book's interior should first and foremost be readable, but it can also be beautiful. Most people aren't able to put into words what makes a professional interior. And because, again, it's much easier to see the difference, I'm going to share a few examples of interiors we've been trusted to redesign. So, what not to wear if you're a book? Inside Edition. This first is called Maidmont Family Stories. It's a family history book. It is not a good use of color. This is a chapter opening two page spread and you definitely can't tell that by looking at it. Once designed properly, you see a gorgeous use of color. The graphics for a book like this are beautiful and has an interesting family tree that you might want to tear out and frame. Um, and it's obviously a chapter opener. This makes the book a true treasure for the family. This is called Special Diets for Special Kids. It's a cookbook for parents with kids on the autism spectrum. Who wants to cook from this? Certainly not I and certainly not my seven-year-old daughter. This was utilitarian at best, definitely uninviting. But this updated version is in color. It shows photos of the recipes. And it's inviting to both the parent and the child. And I give the I have to at least let you know that when the first one was created, full color was prohibitive. But I don't believe, like if you picture the after in, in black and white, it's still the use of layout and shapes and patterns is so much better, even in black and white. Now this is an illustrated kids book, for, it's actually for families, about the biblical book of Revelation. The illustrations are gorgeous, but the layout doesn't do them or the story justice. This new design is so fitting for the book's topic. It allows the illustrations to shine, and it organizes the text in a much more friendly manner. And though the illustrations are smaller, they are much more effective this way. 
And I want people to realize that because a lot of people, when they have a nice illustration or a nice photo, want it to be as big as possible. And bigger doesn't mean better. This is the interior for the novel Vogel and the White Bowl that we saw earlier. Novels do not have to be boring. They're, this one's originally from Vanity Press. It's a thick book. The margins are too small. The heading on the chapter opening page should not be there. <laughs> and it just looks overwhelming and hard to read. This new one is branded from the cover. It's interesting without being overwhelmed with graphics. It has larger margins and other type touches that make it much easier to read. So this example shows the front cover and the interior of a kid's book. It was nearly ready for press. Most of you probably think there's really nothing wrong with it. I like it. I, What's wrong with this? Yeah, well, wait till you see. Okay. So it okay. could have gone to press just like this, but it's a remarkable what a few mostly typographical changes will make. Look at the cover. Oh, the yeah. The title actually pops now. You can read it. It's more interesting. But look at the interior. So look on the right. The word Zoom is nice and big. The rest of the text is bolder. We change the color of it. We change the font. It's exciting. On the left, we not only change the size and the color and the font of the type, but we added more clouds. And now the bubble is more happy in a safer environment. Now the type isn't in danger of flying off into the sky, and it really adds a lot of intrigue, a lot of uh, impact to that illustration. It's, it's crazy how much little details make a big difference. I get it. I get it now. <laughs> it's, it's really crazy. So this last one is called Quiero Ser Poeta. It's a middle grade nonfiction in Spanish aimed at teaching students a love of poetry. The author wanted it to be large format, a full color interior, so that the logos could be in color. Well, first of all, the publisher's logo doesn't belong on the pages of the book. And second of all, if the only color you're going to add is because of the little Colección Oruga logo that we created, then it's a waste of money because full color costs a lot more to print than black and white. So we turned this from an 8.5 by 11 to a 5.5 by 8.5 book. It works very well this way. There's so much fun happening on the inside of this in black and white. Color was not necessary at all. So that cover and the interior all have to work together. We want the look of your entire book to reflect its topic and the tone of the author's writing, or you'll risk giving your reader a false impression. The branding that began on the cover needs to continue in the interior. It increases the perceived value of your book. Readability always has to remain that main purpose, though. Using key elements from the cover within the book continues the book's branding and is used to lead the reader through the text. Creating that package means using fonts and graphic elements on the interior that appear on the cover. If the cover's typefaces aren't appropriate for large blocks of text, then we need to choose something that coordinates with the look, that reflects the tone and the era of the book contents, that reflects the tone of the author's writing, and that allows for easy readability. So let's see what happens when all of this stuff comes together. Abby and Frankie's Help for the Hard Stuff is a workbook that helps children process the traumatic experience of going through a natural disaster like the hurricanes from last year. The interior so obviously uses the styles, the fonts, and the design elements from the cover that I don't need to point them out. Uh, it's just one cohesive, fun package. This is the first novel in a young adult series. It's set in Transylvania. The cover series banner becomes the chapter number banner in the inside. The spider on the cover acts as a drop cap on the inside, and that web from the front can be found at the bottom of the chapter intro page. So even the barcode on the back got a little special treatment from that banner. 
Wild and Wonderful Life is a Christian living and encouragement book for women. The title treatment was given to us by an illustrator in a slightly different layout, so we tweaked it. It is elaborate and gorgeous, but you know, knowing we typically will use the same font from the book's title as the font for the chapter titled inside, but because this one was so heavily illustrated, it's just not practical to do that on the inside. So we've used the font from the subtitle as the title, the chapter title headings. Um, the, the flowers are fun, so we added those. You can see more flowers on the back cover. We have a beautiful watercolor wash on, on the pages that were going to be blank so that they have a little bit more in, interest. Um, one tip, if you have a white book cover, you've probably noticed white book covers blend into the white background and, and places like Amazon. Have your designer give you images of your white cover with a gray line. It's called a key line with a light gray line around it. So it's not in your face and not super bold, but it helps it stand out from Can you the say that background. again? Key line, K-E-Y? K-E-Y-L-I-N-E, key line. Key line. It's so old, I'll make old. the joke here about a key line pie later. But all right. <laughs> you guys, you need to ask your designer for a copy of your cover with a key line around it. Yes, and if your designer's young, they might not understand that term. It is old school. So just ask for a gray line around, a thin gray line around your book cover. <laughs> and this is a cookbook. Uh, it is called Straight Up Food. It's a clean eating cookbook. It has a covered or concealed spiral binding. You can see fonts and a cover photo used on that richly designed section intro page that says a little support. It has coordinating colored texture behind the text there. The rest of the recipe pages complement the cover and the section pages using fonts found on both of those and a color scheme inspired by the cover's photograph. There's so many elements in a cookbook, and you can see that we can't always use the exact font. This is such a cool cover, and the font for the title is great, but it is not good with, uh, with all the recipe titles. So we use, again, the subtitle font. Now, you've seen what does and doesn't work. So might your current book, whether it's published or not quite, be in need of a redesign? There are several reasons to redesign. The most common reason is that you're releasing a revised or updated version or that you intend to reprint a book that's maybe more than five or seven years old. New Social Storybook had done very well over the years for this publisher. But when they updated the content and released a 10th anniversary edition, they knew it was time to update the look. This redesigned edition saw a sales increase of 97%, and the book won a national award for the best redesign. There's a tip about awards. Winning them can greatly increase the publicity opportunities and credibility for authors. So don't hesitate to enter them, but they can be really pricey. So enter wisely. Your designer, your PR expert, your book shepherd should be able to recommend the best ones for your book. Overcoming Autism is a memoir of a very high-functioning autistic woman who designed the first cover herself. Many significant events in her life since that first pr printing caused her to add to the story, so she came out with a new edition, and she knew to be taken seriously. She needed a fresh new cover because she was going to present this around the world. This new design captures her childhood desperation to flee the noise and cacophony of the city that constantly attacked her to the core. So if your sales aren't where you want them to be, consider that the cover could be contributing to the problem. If you're not sure, Ask book designers, ask buyers at a bookstore, ask literary marketing professionals to analyze and critique your cover to see if that might be contributing to the problem. But don't ask your mom. You need an unbiased and industry experienced opinion. Your mom probably tells you everything you do looks great, honey. 
So perhaps your cover suggests the wrong genre or age group for your book. This is a middle grade textbook, but you certainly wouldn't get that impression from the original. The second is colorful and interesting. And I will say that this book was created years before school shootings were common. And if it were done again today, we would advise the author that we would want to remove the gun from the cover of the book. But you can definitely see how these two covers uh, harken to different genres. So sometimes publishers discover that their original title or their subtitle didn't capture the proper audience. When they change that, that usually requires a completely new design to capture the, pro the appropriate message. Or maybe your first cover didn't properly reflect the essence and purpose of your book. There are plenty of things that don't work on this first cover, but the image is one of the most obvious. This book does not sell the author. She is not a celebrity. However, she is very good at what she does. This second book has a bold title. It provides lots of valuable information. And then it shows you a glimpse of the life you could have if you follow her principles. It is much more effective than a picture of the author. And then what if you decide to turn your first book into a series and you didn't know it was going to become a series when you started writing, but those characters just screamed at you and said that they had to come back? Well, it's not too late. You can begin the series with your next book and then update your first book when you're ready to reprint. And that's what happened with the Survivor series. The publisher hired us to do books two and three after book one was, had, had been doing fairly well. So we used their established S from the Survivor's title and um, incorporated that into their series logo. And eventually, the original book was redesigned as well. So with all this, when and where do you find that designer? Now that you know why design is so important, you know, where do you even begin? So first of all, when should you start looking? Ideally, you want to start looking while you're developing your manuscript. You, some firms will help you manage the whole process rather than just design, and they'll help you to avoid potential pitfalls. They'll help you when they give you advice when you're formatting your word file as you're writing so that you don't over or under format it. Uh, if you wait too long, you could jeopardize your schedule because the better firms are generally booked a few months in advance. And if you have your own ideal timeline for bringing out your book and don't look for a designer until you're completely done writing, that could jeopardize your hopeful timeline. If you did wait till you're finished writing, it obviously isn't too late. You just might need to adjust your timeline. So where do you start looking? You can obviously ask other authors who publish quality work. Go to publishers who do the same. I love for people to search resource listings on websites for publishing organizations like apps or like IBPA. Uh, you can look for credit lines on book jackets and copyright pages of books with great design. Ask your literary PR professional, your book marketing professional, book shepherds and coaches for referrals. You can also ask printers if you're already in touch with a printer. And of course, a web search will bring up many options. You just need to be really careful. So here are a few key points to consider. A good designer is going to be interested in your publishing goals as well as your book. So we use a combination of personal conversations and an in-depth questionnaire to get the process started. You need to peruse their portfolios very carefully. If you can't visualize your cover within their body of work, move on. Most designers have a wide range of abilities, but they won't be comfortable drastically changing their style for one project. Um, some designers are very much specialized in, say, science fiction and fantasy covers, and that's mostly what they do. Don't ask them to do a how-to book. That's not in their wheelhouse, and you're not going to get the best design they can give you. If your cover design firm is different than your interior firm, again, make sure they're willing to work together up front before you hire them. Always ask for, for references and always contact them. 
always sign a contract. Make sure there's some kind of timeline. It's, it's at least, if there's not, if there's not deadlines in between, at least have a final deadline when that you know, those files are going to be ready for press. And make sure the contract has clear expectations. And you ideally want to hire somebody who can either just handle the printing for you or recommend a good printing company to work with. Because unless you're familiar with printing specs, this can be a super confusing stage of publishing. You should be discussing with your designer up front the different methods of printing and to have a printer selected before you get too far in the process so that the designer is setting up those files properly for that printer. So the printer, the designer also needs to know if you've decided to go print on demand as your main option yeah. to start. Yes, absolutely. It's good to know ahead of time. It's good to at least know if that might be an option, uh, even if you haven't decided for sure, because there are certain things that are not allowed on print on demand that you can do design-wise if you're offset printing. We found those things out the hard way. So remember, you are not just paying for some artist in a PDF file. This process involves genre and competition research, the author and publisher interviews, extensive image research, many hours of exploratory design to provide the final cover choices you see and a whole ton of them that you never do see. There's technical expertise in creating the files that work with the printer, using that software that has, man, the software is readily available, however expensive, and has a super high learning curve. Um, designers are still, still learning every day new things about their software. Um, and then you should also get images of your book cover and interior for marketing purposes. So we are offering a free PDF to all of you to help you in your search for the right designer and in a little bit, I'll give you details on how to download that. Another note, if you are in need of illustration, be wary, be aware, sorry, that this is a completely different skill set than design. Most people who are gifted at one are not great at the other. And finding somebody who draws well is not the same as finding an illustrator. I can draw very well, but I cannot illustrate to save my life. An illustrator needs to be able to create characters and then create those characters in a way, in different settings, in different positions, in a way that is, is realistic. But you can tell that the same character over and over and over again. And that is not easy to do. Uh, your designer can often help you find the right illustrator for your project. If you already have found an illustrator, then your designer can work with them to produce your book in a nice, uh, cohesive way. Uh, there's, a, there's a lot to think about when you're doing an illustrated book, and your designer and your illustrator should be able to work very nicely together. Beyond all the skills, beyond the expertise, you have got to gel with the person you're working with. This should be fun. You're forming a relationship that will hopefully become long-term. And you should really enjoy this whole process. So all of this can seem daunting. We've actually published a book uh, that guides you through the complete publishing process from writing through printing, marketing, and beyond. The book also provides thought-provoking questions that allow you to journal throughout, it's kind of like a baby book for authors to document your personal publishing process, and it includes instructions and anecdotes along the way. Well, and guys, uh, this book is the reason why I asked Tammy to come online and, and teach you guys all about this. This is, as you can tell, I'm, I've already told her I love her book, but... Uh, this book really, it, it's a wonderful, the thing I love about it is it allows you to get all of your thoughts down in one place because she asks questions that, yes, help with design and publishing, but they're also going to help with marketing, and it's going to help you months from now, years from now, when you're trying to get all your thoughts together about your book for even reprints and the like. Thank you. I would have to agree with that. <laughs> well, of course. So <laughs> and I have to say, finally publishing our own book after working with hundreds of authors for over 20 years, 
finally gave us a new respect for the process that you guys go through. Um, I don't know how you write thousands and thousands of words because this book is 64 pages and as you can tell there's not a whole ton of writing on it and it took us it took some real thought granted you know we're designers first and writers second but um, we really respect everything you go through and just the whole process of when how and when do you let go and send your book to press we are constantly helping our authors let go and say it's, it's time it's really time for your book to go but man when it was our having to do that for ourselves it was tough so we get it now <laughs> so this book can be found at mypublishingjourney.com or on Amazon if you get it off of our website we have a 10% discount at least through July we may keep it up longer uh, just for you if uh, the code is TLC N S for new shelves 18 so we want desperately for you to enjoy this whole journey of producing your book with a proper planning with a little education and a great team you really can publish a beautiful readable book that's not only viable in the marketplace but that stands out for the right reasons so please give your book every opportunity to do well and I really want to thank you for taking your time to participate in the class I appreciate your dedication to quality book publishing I'm happy 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 to talk with you if you have further questions if oh they do I've got questions to ask you yeah yeah so before we go there I just want you to make to make sure that you see on here this free information sheet to help you in your search for a quality designer it's called questioning the design experts and all you need to do is visit tlcbookdesign.com slash free hyphen download to get your free tips and um, it's a it's a one page PDF that will quickly download to your computer and for those and of you who are time. for those of you who are thinking you know about and who are going to be downloading this and ask and trying to find a designer I just want to throw something out there for those of you who are working with book shepherds or editors who are kind of getting you through the process there's um, a lot of benefits to work, actually huge benefits to working with a Sherpa or a book shepherd or, you know, a guide. Absolutely. But don't just use their designers or their editors because they tell you to. You really, it does not mean that you get to shut off your suspicious and, and your, um, uh, inquiring minds I really I mean this the nice thing about these questions that Tammy's asking you to ask them especially if you have an editor or a book shepherd who's helping you is even more so you have to be careful that your designer is going to work with you beautifully because these book shepherds you know I love them I used to be one but it, you know they get used to working with their own team you may actually have a better designer who's a better fit for you but isn't a better fit for your book shepherd and it's more important that the designer work with you beautifully so just just don't assume that because you're working with a guy that their designer that they're going to give you is is always the best choice ask the hard Maybe questions that's so true so true we are actually re we're fixing we're fixing a book that was created by a designer who was recommended by the author's book shepherd and the designer essentially created created a what not to do everywhere um, I, I, don't, I don't know the story I don't know who it is and that's fine it doesn't matter but it obviously wasn't the a, a good designer especially for this book um, and we encourage all the people we speak with to interview other designers too there are lots of us out there and there's lots of you out there and you have got to find the right one for your book for your project and for you so we do have a number of questions that I'd love to, to swing by you. Uh, the first question is about historical novels. Now you said, Tammy, that not every designer has experience in every, so I'm going to ask you first, do you have any experience in historical novels? Yes. All right. Yeah, we like Set in the 1700s, Sue mm -hmm. is kind of looking for advice on color and guidance on her cover and the best fonts for the interior. Now, Sue, I'm... I'm, I think I know exactly what Tammy's going to say, but I'm going to split these two questions up. First, Sue is asking um, the best fonts for an interior for a historical novel. Do you have any suggestions for her? 
Well, the first thing I'm going to say is that every book is different, and even every historical novel is different. So I hesitate giving specific advice without being able to interview you and to know more about your book and your audience and everything. But I will say that there are very traditional typefaces like Garamond, Kazlan, Jansen, and Jensen um, that I would start with. If I were designing the book, I would... I would start with those. Can you list and, those four again? Yes, Garamond, Kazlan with a C, Jensen, J-E-N-S-O-N, and Jansen, J-A-N-S-O-N. <laughs> I would start with fonts like those and experiment with different sizes and print out the pages and see which one feels and reads better with your writing. And this next question, Sue, we're, we're, we're not laughing, we're not giggling, but when you ask what color would be good for a cover, uh, I think that's a little like asking, you know, what, uh, what golf club should I use for the next shot without knowing anything about the shot. But I'll let Tam, maybe Tammy's got a bit of advice. Well, and that's true. You know, it depends on your title. It depends on the setting of your book. There's so many factors that come into play that I can't tell you what color to use. Um, I can tell you, you probably aren't going to have a really bold red cover because that's typically not what you would find in, this, in your book's genre. But just because it's historical doesn't mean you're going to have a parchment and brown colored uh, cover either. So there's a lot of research that would have to be done before I could give you any specific, you know, there there may be four different color schemes that work very well for your book. Um, so I wish I could just tell you, you know, it has to be blue. But that's, but Sue, if you want to start the process, historical novels set in the 1700s, if you want to start the process, I would suggest that you go look at historical novels published by source books. That's one word, source books, or St. Martin's. They have a lot of genre, romance, historical, set in the 1700s, uh, women's fiction, historical women's fiction, and those two, St. Martin's and source books, are known for their good covers. See what kind of colors they use. Yes, and you always want to do research. You need to know what the competition looks like and who's writing it and how they're marketing and all that stuff. So um, one of the questions on our questionnaire is what books are – you considering competitors and a lot of people say none yeah it looks very unique and I don't have competitors and that is never 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 true that is also never acceptable if you are writing a no. book you need to have a dozen no fewer than a dozen authors in your mind that share your readers because of course you have competitors I mean every of course you have competitors your book is not mm -hmm. Your book may not be like anyone else's, but you share readers with hundreds yes. of authors. And who are those readers and who, what authors are they reading? If when you're writing your book, if you don't have a dozen of those authors in mind, and if you're not reading their books and getting to know your genre and your marketplace, you're not ready to be published. Guys, you have to you have to know who the best selling authors are in your genre because they're going to have your readers and you need to find out who those readers are and what they what they're used to. And one of the reasons we ask that is not only because that often sparks um, action in our authors, but that we need to research your competition. So we make sure that your book fits there yet stand out from those books. Yep. Yeah, it's just, it's so important. It's the, most, it's the most important question you can ask early on. What authors and what books are comparable to mine? And you, and again, if you have any fewer than a dozen on the list, keep looking. So Bianca's asking, what is not, what are some of the things not allowed on the book cover if you're going with print on demand? Now, you already said that the barcode can't be messed with. The barcode has to be very plain and, and left alone. Are, is there anything else? Right. Um, on well, one thing cover? we discovered the hard way was that your, any of the type that's on the front cover, say the title, 
cannot be cut off in any way. We, we designed a really cool cover that had a giant, giant letters that purposely got cut off on the left and right of the front cover. And they wouldn't print it. Uh, it everything's very automated, and that's a red flag because if somebody did it accidentally, they don't want them to come back and complain. And there's no way to let them know that you are approving it as is, so they would not let us do that. We had to shrink the title. So There's also a 30 second of an inch give on every print on demand. Your, your cover can shift right or left one thirty second of an inch either way without Ingram thinking anything's wrong. And so you have to have a little more generosity around the edges of your cover than if you were printing offset. Right. They really watch how close you get to all the margins, including the spine. Um, they'll, they have templates available that you should follow and um, the spine type can't can't come within a certain measurement of the edges of the spine so they're very tight with that but the the one unwritten thing that we discovered was that you cannot have type that gets cut off Megan is asking what the price range is for hiring both kinds of designers covers and, and interior at least I'm assuming Megan you you get the gold star because somebody always asks that. <laughs> and everybody probably always wish, wants to be the one that asks that because everybody wants to know. There is a very wide range of pricing for cover design and interior design. You can get covers for a few hundred dollars and you can get cover for $10,000. Um, obviously, for the most part, you do get what you pay for. And again, you're not just paying for a front cover. You're paying for a lot of expertise and research if you're getting it done well. Uh, a quality designer is going to charge anywhere from $1,800 to $4,000 for a full cover. Um, you should always get more than one concept, ideally several. You should be allowed to suggest tweaks and changes without getting, getting charged extra. Uh, there are places like 99designs and, and Fiverr that will let you get cover designs for very, you know, just a few hundred dollars. And most of the time, even I've discovered that there are very talented designers on those sites, but they usually don't know how to use their software properly and they don't know publishing specifications. So we have worked with people's files that you know they've gotten a front cover concept from somebody on one of those websites it's a job sourcing site um, and it looks very nice but it's built so poorly we've had to rebuild it from scratch because it is not done without getting into details it wasn't done properly it wasn't printable uh, so we have to be really careful of using people that just aren't in the book industry um, be, again be sure to just ask for references but um, covers and co interiors some people charge per page for an interior some people charge um, a flat up design fee and then a per page fee and others just charge a flat fee for the entire project um, for the interior and that again I mean some you can get two dollars a page and you can get ten to fifteen dollars a page now, interior-wise, novels should always charge to cost less than a how-to book. The more complex your book is, the more per page it would cost. Color usually costs more than black and white. If you add photographs to it, it could, but doesn't always affect the cost. I know, you know, often up to 30 pictures, we wouldn't charge anything extra, but more than that, we might charge extra for placement. Uh, it, it's just a lot to consider, and then children's books are a whole different, whole different fee schedule um, because you really want the same person to do the interior and the cover when it comes to a children's book. It's a different. Not not every designer knows how to do a children's books, and not every design firm can do children's books well. But that is typically a flat fee for the whole thing cover interior jacket if there is one and that can be and again depends on how much work has to be put into working with the illustrations and illustrator and the page count 
but that can range anywhere from three to six thousand dollars. All right. Uh, Angela's asking if an author has a specific brand that they've been working with. Does the book necessarily need to follow that brand? And if so, um, I guess my follow-up question for you is, how much should you expect the designer to work with an author to try and incorporate, incorporate their brand into, I'm, Angela, I'm going to assume this is a nonfiction book, but if an author's got a branding um, uh, profile, a branded profile out there, uh, Timmy, how important is that to, to his or her book? Well, I think it's very important. If your book, if the purpose of your book is to augment or further your brand, you've got to make it all be cohesive. So your designer should be expected to somehow incorporate that. Um, you saw in the Guide to Winning Clients, we use the, the author's color scheme that is part of his brand already. Uh, sometimes you'll find the person's logo or the company logo is appropriate for the front cover, but not always, um, not usually, but sometimes it is. Um, perhaps your company's name is also the name of the series of books, you know, um, XYZ Company Presents perhaps would be on the cover. But branding is very important in all of this. So if your book has nothing to do with your brand, even though you've got a really big brand, obviously you don't want to just randomly add it there. But definitely, definitely want to do that. Now, sometimes people have come to us and their brand, look, the look of their brand isn't very professional. And because they're heading out with their first book to augment their brand, we actually use that as an opportunity to upgrade their entire brand and not just their book. So we'll create a new brand for everything. All right. Well, let's see if there's any other questions. Uh, guys, we're going to take uh, two more questions, and then I'm going to have to go, I'm afraid. Um, Sue is saying, if designed professionally, uh, can a black and white cover be as effective as color? What, what's your opinion on black and white covers? Absolutely. If it is a good designer, now it's a challenge, but a good designer knows how to use those five elements of design well enough to come up with a beautiful black and white cover. Uh, I know I started design before computers were very sophisticated and before it was cost effective just to, like everything's printed in color now. And when I started that wasn't the case. It cost a lot more to, co to print in color. So we liked to do black and white covers because our clients needed to be able to afford to do that. Um, it just depends on the genre of the book. Sometimes you really do need color to, um, to communicate the right message. But gosh, a good black and white cover is a piece of art. I, I really love them. Yeah, have you guys heard of Malcolm Gladwell, for heaven's sakes? <laughs> yeah. All right, Adolphus. Uh, hi, Adolphus. How are you? Um, this is going to be our last question, and then um, we're going to let Tammy get on with her day. Tammy, I want to thank you. Uh, Adolphus is asking, if, Tammy, if you can repeat the discount link again. Oh, oh sure. sure. She's, she's going right to it. So you can go to mypublishingjourney.com, and the discount code is TLC, N as in new, S as in shelves. 18. Look at that branding. 18. And that'll give you the discount on the book. We have hardcover and softcover. While I'm very, very grateful to Tammy for giving us this, what is almost an hour and a half of her day, guys, you guys stuck with it this whole time. There's just as many of you on now as there was at the, the top of the 2 o'clock hour. I, I really want to thank you for sticking with us and, and your commitment to design. It it is not ever to be taken lightly. Uh, educating yourself as authors or as potential new micro publishers or independent publishers, uh, anyone who takes the time to educate and to learn has my undying respect. Um, it is, this is an industry that is too filled with people who just want to rush to printing 
as opposed to learn how to publish. And Tammy is part of a select group of people who truly understand publishing. So I recommend her. Um, she's one of my favorites. Uh, again, we're not selling anything here. I just wanted Tammy to teach you guys the ins and outs of design. For those of you who are watching this on a replay or on my YouTube channel, there's some links below to Tammy's webpage and mine. And we have loved being here with you guys. Thank you so much for, um, for the help, for the great questions. If we did not answer something that we should have, I am going to uh, download the chat box. You feel free to email me at amy, A-M-Y, at newshelves.com, and I will get those questions to Tammy, and she and I will happily answer them via email. Tammy, I hope you don't mind I'm volunteering you, but... Um, oh, I was going to volunteer myself. So I am always happy to answer questions. Whether you hire me or not, I'm here to help. Um, we know that we're not the right firm for everybody, but I can answer questions and I can help. And we want all of you to have a super successful, super enjoyable experience in putting out your book and creating that book. And, um, and we're here just to help. All right. Thank and you for those so, of you so who much, are asking everyone. more questions, we will email them to you. Thanks, everyone. Have a great day.